Hello and welcome to the last Tomlin Harmonica podcast of 2020. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for uh, listening and uh, making this a fun project that I started this year um, during the COVID pandemic. And uh, hopefully 2021 will be uh, slightly less COVID heavy and uh, a little bit more harmonica heavy. Uh, but I, I've been having a, a really great time doing this and I, I've really enjoyed uh, reading the feedback that I've been getting as well. Uh, so I hope that you have a wonderful holiday season and I hope that you enjoy this week's episode uh, where I'll be chatting about different approaches uh, for improvisation with my incredibly good friend, Harry Higgs. Hello, Harry, and thank you so much for uh, joining me on today's podcast. How are you doing today? Oh, pretty good, man. Pretty good. So uh, what, what are you drinking? I'm drinking an Innocent Garden Lager beer. Very nice. I have a milk stout uh, by Drygate. Uh, for anyone listening, we are, we're, we're definitely evening time, and it's, it's an appropriate moment in the day to have a chat about improvisation and have a beer. It's not nice to lie. It's eight in the morning, Tomlin. That's a totally appropriate time. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. It is six six o'clock in the evening uh, in Edinburgh, Scotland. So uh, yeah, we're going to be chatting a little bit about uh, improvisation today. But before we do, I thought I'd uh, tell you a little bit about our guest. So this is uh, not a harmonica player, uh, but this is my very good friend, Harry Higgs, who is uh, a guitarist who I, I play with at every available opportunity. Uh, he's the guitarist in uh, my band Delacroix, and we've done a bunch of other stuff together. Uh, we've, we've done workshops together. We, we've done a, a lot of cool projects yeah, a lot of cool projects. It's uh, and over a few years now, eh? Yeah, it's been it's been a good while, and uh, yeah, we've. Um, I think I've been struggling not being able to get a jam in with you over lockdown. Um, I don't know how you feel about it. I, d I don't really want to know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I'm yeah, uh, finding it quite difficult not playing uh, music with other people in the same room. Mm. Uh, there's only so much you can do at home. And it's definitely, it, it, I think it's the ideal, uh, like, workshop time. You know, you can really get down to the nitty gritty of technique and practice, but it's not quite the same. It's it's very fun playing music with your friends and playing in front of people. And it's, uh, yeah, it's been it's been tough not doing that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, well, it's, it's the woodshed time, isn't it? We're, we're not actually seeing each other face to face, so we, we spend more time with a metronome than we do with... Uh, real human beings, which is uh, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pros and cons, pros and cons. So what I thought would be quite fun uh, is, because you, you, you teach a lot, uh, I, I kind of want to go through how you approach teaching improvisation, but at kind of dif different stages. So, you know, what how, how you get started with someone who's never improvised before and is maybe quite a, um, a kind of beginner level player, technically not very advanced. What How do you present it to them right, right at uh, square one? Oh, that's a, an interesting question, given that, uh, I don't know, I think that I don't really have a concrete concrete way of teaching that um i think really the the the, the beginning of it all I, I try and encourage my students just to play whatever they think sounds good on an instrument and that's with no scale involved or anything like that you know predominantly i'm teaching guitar um and <laughs> Uh, to begin with, you know, you start off just learning a couple of notes. I'm just, oh, you know, what what do you think sounds good? Just show show me what you've been messing around with this week, you know. And it starts off like that. And then, you know, depending on uh, a particular student's interest, we sort of go down the avenue if it's, uh, if, if they're into the folk kind of sound or blues, rock, anything like that. We'll, we'll generally always start with, uh, you know, the pentatonic scale, whether it's major or minor. Um, and as soon as those sounds become familiar, um, and my student would be like, oh, I know this sound, this sounds good. I, I'm surprised how easy it is just to play along to this, this rhythm that you're playing. And I'm like, okay, well, this is just the start of it, you know? Um, 
so from there, I'd say I just tell them to play around and scale. I, I, I keep it fairly simple and only stick to one octave to begin with. And, you know, there's no pattern to learn or anything like that. Mm -hmm. You just, just have fun with the notes that you've got available. If you're sticking to the scale, you're not going to do anything wrong. Yeah. That's kind of, I say that's step one, really. Mm -hmm. A fairly I, broad step, and that can take a long time. But yeah, that's no. The... But th I think that that that's that's a, a really solid first step. Uh, I'm I'm always intrigued with uh, how people deal, how teachers deal with the student who comes in who's a little bit more analytical. Um, I'm sure you've had those those people come in who you say to them, okay, just just have a little noodle and see what feels good, and you can just see them freeze up. I see the f freeze up, and also I always get the thing, oh you know, so what do you want me to do? I'm like, well, whatever you want. I don't know what I want. <laughs> like, well, just just try, just try. It's, it really is, it's diving into the deep end where I'm just at the start there, you know, so uh, it, just l learning that it's okay just to play anything. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, that's tricky. It's tricky for some, certainly the over-analytical student that you... Uh, have suggested that kind of student yeah yeah i i generally find that w what i try and do with that kind of student is is we'll work on a solo that, that i've written and then i'll i'll give them a parameter that they can change uh, so i can i'll say okay so uh why don't you play with how loud and how quietly you're playing each of these notes in the tune and they can usually they're they're okay with that and then by the time they've played through the solo with their own dynamic elements, they're like, okay, you just improvised. And they're like, no, 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 I didn't because I was playing what you wrote. It's like, no, I didn't write it like that. You changed things about it. That's improvisation. Yeah. And I think sometimes you need to trick people into doing it. Um, how, how does this kind of compare with how you started improvising? Can you remember the first steps when you were a, a beginner? Uh, my... Yeah, I can. <laughs> My guitar teacher, um, who, uh, yeah, lovely musician, really talented. Uh, when it came to being an all round musician, he was extremely talented. In terms of being a guitarist, uh, I don't think he necessarily knew what he was doing at any point in time uh, and would show me, he showed me five notes that worked for him any time that he was put in a position where he would solo and I, I kid you not it was not it was not the pentatonic scale it what? wasn't yeah, it w wasn't the bb box you know it had it, it was a very loose representation of what you could play over a major chord mm -hmm. um but it, it did start off like that and i was you know i'll actually show you so here I have a guitar. It's perfect for this. Uh, so it was actually the first tune I ever improvised over was um, a tune called Kansas City. Uh, 12 bar blues kind of thing. Nice. And then we go, you know, into the, into mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, the whole progression. And it was in the key of A. So you'd expect A, you'd either use an A major pentatonic. Oh, I've chucked in the blues note there. Or an A minor pentatonic. I know that now. But at the time, uh, Daniel, my guitar teacher, said, oh, well, you can play these five notes. Okay. Which is the major third, fifth, sixth, root, and then nine. Um, they don't work for blues, not really. I think they do now, because I know what those sounds, what I can do with those sounds. But at the time, you know, I didn't know bending or like licks. I didn't really know any of that. I before him, I was uh, in a conservatory for music, you know, mm -hmm. where it was all classical and you know, I only play what's on the page. Um, but yeah, messing around with those five awkward notes, um, I started making mistakes that sounded cool. Mm. So I was like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, there's something going on here, there's something that I can, uh, you know, look into. And uh, so I actually discovered that if I, with a really small change, rather than playing that, I avoided that note like we played, because every time we played, you know, went into the four chord, 
I'd play that, so it would end up sounding oh. clashy and awful. So I, I just decided that I didn't like that that first note that Daniel taught me. So I was like, I love that. Um, I like those two. So the fifth and sixth, and then the root. Of course, that sounds great. But I realized if I ever slipped up and then played oh, shit. the flat seven, I was like, oh, that, that sounds bluesy. Yeah. And I was like, why do I have only two notes on each of these strings? What happens if I then play nine and then I use my third finger then to play the next fret? And I was like, okay. And it started making sense. All of those sounds kind of started sort of coming to me. And um, yeah, I don't know. I'd say that's kind of how it started for me. And then playing along to my favorite tunes and uh, finding out that there was a, a structure to the things that they were playing. And it was, you know, all part of a scale. And as soon as I learned the scale and then started playing along to those tunes even more and tried to pick out the melodies. I, I was a big Santana fan. Um, and Santana has a, a habit of playing uh, melodies rather than solos, mm -hmm. which are actually really, you know, not impossible to follow. So I would try and follow him, you know, playing along to the song, get it wrong all the time, but always try and catch up. Mm -hmm. And I found that my vocabulary, vocabulary uh, improved. And also I started discovering all these new techniques and also being pushed to try and keep up. Mm -hmm. uh, just in general, my technique improved. I I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's a bit wishy washy. But I, I think that's really important for people to hear because you you started by being given a, a, a little bit of a premise that you can use to improvise. Uh, it, it wasn't actually the most obvious premise. It wasn't the minor pentatonic scale, which is the safest place to start. And mm -hmm. uh, I know a lot of harmonica uh, people start with the blues scale. The blues scale is just the minor pentatonic with the four draw bend added in second position, which is known as the flat five. Um, it's, it's, it's a great note, but if you take that out, you've got the minor pentatonic, still a very safe scale to start with. Uh, but yeah, you started with a premise and then you looked at how you could apply it to different situations and you did trial and error. And I think that mm -hmm. the trial and error is the most important thing. Um, mm -hmm. And listening to stuff that you really like, you know, it's exactly the same process that you and I and everyone listening has gone through to learn a language. You know, when, when you're a very small person, you make noises uh, and you think that you're making noises that are the same noises that your parents are making. And your parents don't look at you and say, try harder. Uh, yeah. they, they think it's amazing and, and they make noises mm -hmm. back at you. You get conversation and bit by bit, that sort of rough approximation of what you heard turns into actual language. And mm -hmm. it's, it's the same with improvisation. It, yeah, improvisation and... and uh, music in general maybe mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah i i like this idea uh you you said something cool about uh awkward notes and i, I think that that kind of maybe naturally moves into the the kind of next level of teaching improvisation you know what about step two what you've got someone who's been improvising for uh, a little bit of time they're comfortable playing based around a basic scale like the minor pentatonic or the major pentatonic. Yeah. Uh, how do you start introducing those awkward notes and, and how can people start, you know, learning how to use awkward notes? I don't know how this will translate to harmonica, um, but certainly on guitar, the minor pentatonic scale over a major blues is awkward. I mean, it sounds cool, but mm. it is awkward. It's tense, you know, for a lot of, you yeah, know, most of the notes through the scale. So I think it may be in. in I, what 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 scale do you would you start teaching somebody on the harmonica? Is it the major pentatonic or the minor pentatonic? No, it's it's always oh, the minor it, pentatonic. Well, so uh, me personally, as a harmonica teacher, I teach something called that I call a simplified pentatonic scale. Mm -hmm. But. It, it's with a view to getting to the minor pentatonic as quickly as possible, but you you need bends for the the minor pentatonic and the major yeah. pentatonic. But my my simplified pentatonic scale has a root, a third, a fourth, uh, a fifth, and a flat seventh. So it's okay. everything apart from the minor third from the minor pentatonic. Right, gotcha. Um, and obviously there is a, a degree of awkwardness with that major third, mm -hmm. uh, especially over the four chord. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. But but it, it gets people playing the right shape, just physically. They they're playing the right holes in the right sequence. Okay, um, so so just I'll let me interject. So any any listeners here that are learning from Tomlin, uh, his simplified minor pentatonic is actually a mixolydian scale. So you can tell people that you know something. <laughs> you, you, you can't call it a mixolydian scale without the other stuff. It's still only a, a five note scale, whereas the yeah. mixolydian is a seven note scale. Yeah, it still sounds impressive though, isn't it? Yeah. Those are the important notes from the Mixolydian. <laughs> and and this is the thing, is is you kind of build a safe selection of notes without the awkward notes. And that, yeah, that sounds yeah, great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I start people with that. But then ver- as soon as they can bend that three draw down a half step and get the minor third, then we're in, in minor pentatonic territory. And I actually right. don't introduce the major pentatonic until a little bit later. Mm-hmm. Um but I mean that that's partly because my my angle is very minor pentatonic playing. Mm-hmm. Um it, so it's definitely a a focus of mine. Uh it's not necessarily the right approach. So the I don't know. It's 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 a difficult question, Tomlin. <laughs> Let me Right. So awkward notes. I think it may be the first so, awkward sounding thing that you'd learn to play um, within the minor pentatonic scale is is use of that flat fifth, and it, it is you know uh, the best example I can think of is Pink Panther. You know, you know people recognize that yeah. fairly quickly. So what I always say is that with improvisation, it is about you know uh, uh, you know. It, Building some sort of tension and awkward notes, or if, if we, you know, to use that word, are really good for building tension. But then resolution is equally important, um, and I think that's that flat fifth is probably the first one that I'd tackle. You know, saying you can go up to it, but you don't want to hang on it too yeah. low. You have got to move away from it fairly quickly, and it's, it'll sound really musical um, if you hold on it for. It sounds horrible. It sounds really horrible. But in context, it can sound great. So I think that's probably the the first the first note. Mm-hmm. That, um, I would say is the awkward one. Yeah, it's funny because because for me that the first kind of awkward note, uh, well, the first note that I try and get people to really know what they're doing with is what kind of third you're playing over mm-hmm. what chord in the progression. So actually playing over changes um, and highlighting that. So for people listening. We play generally a major third over the one chord. So that's the clean three draw in second position. Um, you can play the, the minor third and it sounds really cool, but it's, it's, it's a minor note over a major chord. So it's, there's a, a level of tension, not a huge level. It, it's sweet. It's not like the flat five, mm-hmm. but th- there's a level of tension. But what I really like getting people to learn how to do is to play that that major third over the one chord and then play the minor third so bending that note down a half step over uh, the four yeah, chord so you're sort of doing that yeah yeah great um, and it's it's just a really good way for a, a player to demonstrate very quickly that they're thinking about the chord changes and they're thinking about note choice over the chord changes oh, see that's that's the amazing thing about the harmonica community as far as i can see you know the one of the first things you're taught uh given the way that the instrument is tuned is that you really do need to learn how to play over the changes Mm -hmm. otherwise it it won't sound good um on the guitar you can get away with so much more you don't need to learn how to play i didn't really learn how to play over the changes until i was i don't know 20 20 years old Uh, i'm sorry so in terms of years playing Oh, well, years improvising that's about 10 years on yeah that's that's late but you know you launch them straight in mm-hmm. <laughs> which is great uh certainly you know you start thinking a lot more musically at an earlier stage than you would with a guitar yeah i think it's the harmonica because it the way it's the way it's laid out the the notes are, are you know kind of very easily achievable to kind of follow a, a chord progression um but but you can't play the chord progression and i think your your role in the band can quite quickly um 
become quite useless if you're just a soloist, whereas a guitarist can always come back to playing the rhythm. So I yeah. think learning to follow the changes really demonstrates that you can be a musical addition to a band rather than just someone who wants to have a solo and have their, you know, 20 seconds of fun time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that, that's what it is. You know, we all really want to take a solo, uh, yeah. but you've got to put the time in being an accompanist as well. Yeah. Um, Agreed. But there are still, there are plenty of um, harmonica players who kind of go along the journey themselves and just discover the sweet sounding like wailing notes and don't know how to play over the changes. And mm -hmm. they, they still sound great. They still do something that works as a solo, but but then they're quite limited um, outside of that. You know, they can't f back up a singer and a guitarist just by kind of noodling using wailing notes. It's It doesn't yeah. really work. I hear you, yeah. <laughs> cheers buddy it's nice to chat yeah it's great to chat how's that how's that innocent gun going down oh it's good probably a little bit too easy <sighs> there's nothing wrong with that it's yeah. it's it was your birthday yesterday so it, it's still birthday time yeah it, well, that's the way i'm treating it anyway yeah <laughs> <laughs> um okay so how important do you do you find okay, let, I'm, I'm going to jump a little bit ahead. Uh, I want to come back to these different steps of, of teaching. Um, but I, I, I'm always really interested with any player with how they visualize improvising themselves. So not necessarily how they teach it, but, you know, and let's just keep it within within a 12 bar blues for now. You know, kind of mm -hmm. keep it quite, quite simple harmonically. How, how do you approach that? Um... I play I it's hard it's hard to say Tomlin when I when I learned the stuff it was all it was all by ear um I didn't have somebody teaching me how to play the blues other than listening to the blues mm -hmm. um that's probably quite an irritating answer it's not at all it's really good for people to hear because that's how I've learned and that's how most people learn I think I, I don't know what you think about this but the idea that improvisation has to be purely creative is, I, I think, wrong. I think improvisation is taking vocabulary and making it your own and applying it to the, the, the situation you're in in a musical way. Well, I think maybe I did that, but completely by accident. Yeah. Um, I'm still learning really basic blues licks. I really like the, the, my, you know, the most recent blues lick that I learned is two notes, and okay. I love it. It's one. It's it's honestly one of my favorite licks. It's when you when you move into the fourth chord, uh, you just play the third from the fourth chord and and the and then the root above. Uh, okay. Of the fourth. Uh, it's a Matt Schofield look. Okay. I've I've been milking it. I've been using it far too much. But I, you know, let's say we're, you know over the one. Uh, so. Just that okay you know uh nice. i'm still learning all, all that kind of stuff but i think well, when i approach improvisation over a 12-hour blues now I, I i i do think about the changes a lot more than i used to um i think it's become a, a bit of a you know a bit of a mission to rather than uh set out to impress people by flashy note choices mm -hmm. um I've been trying to simplify my playing just to be as tasteful as possible. It's been a long journey. Um, I think I'm still still on it as well. <laughs> you never, but but never that, that's the joy of it, isn't it? You know, it's you're constantly trying to find your voice and refine your voice, and that that's every every good musician does that. Um, mm -hmm. Just as a side note for any harmonica players who want to know what, what those notes were, that would be the two blow and four blow uh, over the four chord. So you've got the two blow, which is the third, then you're jumping up to the four blow, which is the, the root note, but an octave above uh, the one blow. And that yeah, that would be a really nice move. Um, and that's the question I get all the time uh, from harmonica students is, can you teach me some four chord licks? Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is something that I'm kind of intrigued from you uh, how you approach playing over a four chord. Do you think chord arpeggio or do you mm -hmm. think 
uh, scale change? Like what, what's the, what's the angle? So now it's, now it's chord arpeggio. Now it's an arpeggio thing. Uh huh. Cause I found that those notes are, were just way more fun. Um, but when I first, when I recognized that there was a change, um, I would just change from a minor pentatonic or major pentatonic into a Dorian scale. Um, Dorian and that is from the one. So let to be very specific here. Let's say we're in the key of G. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> you've played with harmonica players before. <laughs> <laughs> so if I'm playing my minor pentatonic or even my major pentatonic, I realize that uh, if I change then to a G Dorian scale, which is only a, a very small change. Um, from a, a minor pentatonic, you're adding a note to a minor pentatonic. Mm -hmm. So instead of just playing that, I'm, I'm excluding the blues note just to make it a little bit more simple. I'm going to add that note there. So that's an E. Okay. Um, what's that so for that, you? So that's the six. Yeah. Uh, it is the six, but uh, yeah, yeah. in terms of, uh, were you doing a four blow or something? It, was, it would be a five blow. Uh, oh, that's close. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> close. <laughs> so. But I, so I didn't. So when I when I found out that I could just, you know, I'd play yeah. like that. I'd play like that over a four, and it doesn't sound bluesy at all. But it's funny because you you say that that you know you're switching to the Dorian, but in my mm -hmm. mind you're not switching to the Dorian. You're starting to outline the arpeggio notes of the of the four chord because you're you're yeah. throwing in the third of the four chord, mm -hmm. which you wouldn't play over the one chord. Yeah. Yeah. So well, this is how it started. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was I was just oh great. So this is just a, a, a you know I'm adding one note and now I've got a cool scale that has a fancy name. Um, but it then went from just playing these sort of Dorian licks or including the sixth. and then resolving back to the one and things like that. Uh, it went from that into me recognizing the shape that I can get from including that uh, that six, I can actually now have a diminished scale over the four. Okay. Yeah, this was actually, this is a while ago I, I figured this out. I didn't really have the ear to use it properly, but I feel like I'm getting there now. Um, so if I'm playing over the C, the four, the four chord, I can start this little arpeggio from the third, the minor third. Is that um, the minor third of the four chord? No. So let's. So okay, this minor is third of the one chord. Of, okay. Yeah. 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 So uh, starting up. Yeah. Starting there. Going to my flat five. Mm -hmm. Six. Okay. The root of the one chord, so okay. G, and the minor third, and you. You know. Okay. It sounds stupid. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't work for blues music at all. But, it, you know, within context, it can. So I'll, let, let me try and put something over that. So over the one. So I don't know if you heard that run. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's... It's quite an exotic sound, but mm -hmm. it's all fine. You've got yep. third, flat five, six, root, minor third. They're all acceptable notes. Mm -hmm. um, and then resolving to the to the third there for the one. I don't know. So that was the next step of like uh, playing over the four. And then finally it was like, oh, all that fancy stuff is overkill. Let me just play. The root third and fifth of the four chord. That sounds great. I'll take that. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's a, an interesting process because um, I I never did the fancy stuff because I'm I'm not that smart. So I, I kind of watch you do the diminished stuff, and I was like, uh, you know, my my brain is <laughs> <laughs> struggling to keep up. And and there's a bit of me that feels that part of it is is kind of mechanically advantageous on the instrument. So. Mm -hmm you know that 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 move on the guitar 
kind of makes sense. You know, it, it, the notes are laid out in a way that your fingers can find them quite easily. Whereas if, mm -hmm. if I try and replicate that on the harmonica, it's definitely doable, but it's, it's not something that I'm going to find by accident. Okay. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I'm not slightly not sure about is, is whether, you know, the diminished idea works if you're hanging on any of the notes or if, if it's kind of built on the idea that you have to get there, get through it quickly and resolve to something safe. Well, actually you, you can hold on those notes because I, with the exception of the flat five, because we can all agree that flat five sounds pretty gross if you hold on it, but the other notes are fine. You know, guess, you've got the root, the minor third, third and the yeah. So that, that's nothing too weird. And, and, you know, the flat third is, is the flat seven of the four chord. So that, that's a nice one. The six is the third of the, f okay. So it does all make sense. It just sounds so exotic when you play it like that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but those notes just, you know, you can just repeat the same notes over and over again mm. and you are playing a diminished scale, but, um, they're completely appropriate and okay to do. Yeah. Nice. And that's a transferable, you know, thing. But mm -hmm. like you said, uh, mechanically advantageous on the guitar for sure. Um, but I can use that same lick that I just played there or that same arpeggio. I can use that in loads of different contexts mm -hmm. and it'll work. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was a good thing to, to have under the belt. Uh, that's cool. Uh, whereas, you know, harmonica, the, the kind of mechanically advantageous thing is all the blow notes on the harmonica are the four chord. Like, well, in my very limited ability on the harmonica, even I know that. Yeah, but, <laughs> but you know, so you can, you can do these kind of... You can, you can kind of slide up and, and you're playing a very fast arpeggio. <laughs> yeah. But you're just blowing through three notes and then throwing in the flat seven, which will either be the three draw half step bend in the lower octave or the six overblow in, in the middle octave. Um, or the 10 double blow bend, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that's something that I, I think the arpeggio playing is more obvious in some ways on the harmonica than it would be on the guitar. Um, yeah, I, I think it makes sense for a beginner to play arpeggios on, on a harmonica a lot sooner mm -hmm. on a, than a guitar beginner. Oh, yeah. No, it's, it's uh, trying to... I have, um, you know, quite a few very talented students, but I still need to convince them of this stuff. I still have to, you know, really sell <laughs> to them that they need to practice arpeggios and understand, you know, the, the structure of, of chords and, and the scales that they're playing and the notes that they're choosing, it's important to know what they are. Mm -hmm. you know? Okay, so th this is a great question. And this is something that I, I get asked all the time, which is how important is it for me to know music theory? Um, do you like music? <laughs> yeah. Then you should know theory. I know it's a bit it's a bit blunt. Yeah, but no, I I agree. I think, I, well, sorry, that's you know maybe even uh, that's unfair. I think if you like playing music and you like discovering new sounds, um, and you enjoy you know figuring things out by ear or anything like that, I think it is important to know theory. Um, w without that, you you're just you're memorizing things visually mm -hmm. or, or physically. You're not. You're not thinking about the sound of things or, or why a certain note with an over a harmony would bring bring a certain emotion with it. You know, you need to you need to understand the formula. Yeah. Um, what do you say to the person who comes back to you and, and says, well, what about my creativity? Am I not going to lose my creativity if I know the rules? There, well, no, there are no rules. There's theory. There's yeah, yeah. <laughs> OK, so. Uh, well, I don't know what the good way, what a good way to put it. Oh yeah, okay. So let's think about theory like uh, the colors of the rainbow. All okay. right, we we've broken them down into <laughs> you know very you know, but it's it's such a spectrum. There are so many things that are there in between each color, you know. And it's the same thing with theory. If you know what the foundations are, um, you can start manipulating things in a way that you know the possibilities are endless mm -hmm. musically speaking I, I don't think 
you know, with with all the music that we've had over the last hundreds of years, uh, we're not done. We're mm. not finished with the plain formula. We're, we're you know we're still working within twelve notes. Yeah, you, that, that, that's the thing uh, in Western music anyway. Yeah. And we're not even finished with that. No, we, we have to kind of ignore, you know, most commercial pop music at the moment. But you know, I don't think we're done. Don't mm-hmm. think we're done discovering what we can do just with those twelve notes. Yeah, and I, I think that the the argument for having a strong foundation of of music theory to help you discover things is is it's so important because you know there there is the anecdote of you know if you, if you sat a bunch of monkeys down at typewriters they would eventually by sheer chance write the complete works of shakespeare Mm -hmm. and but it's going to take so long and it's going to be complete luck versus you know if if you know the rules then you you can sorry i keep saying rules and you're right there are no (laughs) rules but if if you understand theory then Mm -hmm. it, it gets you there so much faster and you can make intelligent decisions about how you play and and your note choice um i guess i guess one thing that a lot of people wonder about is how this this functions in the heat of the moment so we, we, we you know we're talking a lot about practicing improvisation and thinking about note choice uh but i i, I don't think that you do that quite so uh rigorously in the heat of the moment do you no i'll occasionally you know, give myself a nudge and remind myself that I need to think about what I'm doing now and then just to Mm -hmm. reel it in. You know, I do get carried away. You know that. (laughs) Uh, I'm saying nothing. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. After a hundred bar solo, I think it gets a bit, it gets a bit much. Um, Yeah. uh, I think in a, in a live situation, I, I, I really, love and right now during these times miss the moments where i i cease to think Mm -hmm. about what i'm doing and only listen to what i'm playing as i'm playing it um it's something so very you know second nature and and automatic now um that i get to enjoy the experience almost as a listener as i'm playing Mm -hmm. um but uh, you know it the process is happening so quickly that if i do play something that focuses very much on, again, in the context of a 12-bar blues. If I'm following the changes, um, the, the, I will occasionally make conscious decisions to play certain things. Mm-hmm. Um, but it just happens so quickly. Yeah. And and I think that's only a, a result of, uh, you know, when, when I have a lot of free practice that I, you know, I don't play with a metronome i play along to music mm-hmm. or sometimes i just noodle um N- noodle just... is a technical term by the way <laughs> a technical term for doing whatever the hell you want yeah <laughs> um yeah uh i don't know i think i think the more free practice i've done and the more noodling um it's allowed me to become very uh meditative when i play uh and sort of not become overwhelmed with all the things that I should be doing mm-hmm. and uh, just play what I feel. Yeah. I, I think that that's, that's the, the best um, advertisement for doing lots of practice ever mm-hmm. is do tons of practice so that you can forget what you're doing when you need to. Yeah. Um, and I, I think when I, when I start taking a solo, I generally think about the first two bars and then usually everything stems from that following my kind of patterns that I know and my ways of improvising, my ways of thinking around a chord change. Um, there's there's something I, I really love that uh, Harry uh, talks about with his students, and he's actually done a, a seminar over at the, the harmonica school, but it's, it's this idea of different stages in a solo. And that's something that goes through my mind when I'm playing sometimes. And, I, and I've watched you play following these different stages, which you call different gears um, and, and kind of, you know, you, you have a first part of the solo. And, and let, let's imagine that you were doing a kind of 48 bar uh, solo. If you're very, very fortunate, they let you go four times round. Um, so w- will you talk to us a little bit about, about these different gears and, and how you think about them? Uh, sure. I think the, the, uh, the metaphor 
I guess, I mean, you could you could use many things. You're trying to create a narrative with your solo. You, it's definitely a good thing to create a, a narrative and a theme um, within your solo. And that, you know, musically speaking, that means you're playing very dynamically. You know, playing with the the intensity of the notes, whether you're playing them loud or quiet. Um, the frequency as well, you know, how fast you're playing them, um, how you can hold on to certain tones, like those awkward notes we were talking about, mm -hmm. building tension and release. Um, within the, the whole geared structure, let's let's say you do have those four rounds of a 12-bar blues, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you want to ease people in uh, with an idea, uh, a simple melodic idea that you can play around with and make very small changes to to suit the chord changes. Um, let's see. So let's see. It was the first 12 bars of a solo. So I'll just play the turn around. Pretty laid back. But it doesn't take much for me to then adapt that to the four chord. Yeah. Uh, even for the five. So that would be, you know, a nice and easy first mm -hmm. gear. So, you know, taking lots of breaks, uh, lots of breathing space in between all of that. You're not playing constantly through mm -hmm. through it all uh gear two you, you so yeah gear two is when you start taking those ideas um and you fill in the gaps with a few other things a few more variations so you're not leaving as much space in between your phrasing um and just start making things a bit more exciting mm -hmm. so that, that that doesn't mean you're playing faster it just means that you're filling more space um, it, it can mean that you're playing faster or louder, but I think you can save that for the next, mm -hmm. for the next step. Uh, you're following me. I'm following you. I'm following you. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I well, mean, one thing I'll me... just, I'll just really quickly interject. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure the listeners noticed that 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 first gear was so sweet and easy to listen to that you could whistle back or hum back what you heard. You know, you, you've not challenged the listener yet. Mm -hmm. That comes later. I think that that's an important thing. It's you, you want to reel them in at the beginning of the solo, make it easy to follow, so yeah. that they're they're really paying attention. Yeah, exactly. And then in gear two is where you you probably want to, um, uh, you know, start having an argument with the audience a little bit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, we'll save the uh, presidential debate for gear three. But... <laughs> Well, you did say this wasn't a political podcast. I'll that's true, that's true, that's true. So, you know, leading into the same idea I played it. So just getting a bit, just mm -hmm. a bit more exciting there, but still keeping that groove going, so yeah. not, you know. And also definitely, uh, you know, playing within the bars you know mm -hmm. musical ideas within a bar or within a couple of bars so not playing over the bar mm -hmm. that, that definitely comes later so uh gear three that's when you can start taking some really repetitive ideas or patterns um to build speed and tension again so if i was in my third round of a 12 bar blues after playing that for you know the 24 So that's a much longer phrase, and that would have played over the bar as well. Um, so again, getting more exciting, and then saving all your your best stuff for your last gear, your fourth round. Uh, that can be, you know, speedy lakes or the most in, the most uh, the highest level of intensity of which you can play. Mm -hmm. um, some players, the person I can think of that demonstrates that really well is a guitarist called Derek Trucks, slide player. He just moves up 
on up. So he moves up higher in his register on the instrument. You know, it keeps mm-hmm. moving up, but doesn't play any faster or anything like that. But it'll start holding notes and really trying to make those sing. Yeah. Um, so he's not a fast player by any means. I'm sure he can play fast, but he doesn't choose to. But yeah, that's his his final gear is definitely all all the really sweet singing notes and wailing notes as you put them earlier. Um, at the most, at the highest level of intensity. Very cool. Yeah, I I think all all of that is open to your own interpretation, and there, there again there are no rules. It's mm-hmm. a guideline, and you do want to take people on a bit of a journey when you are soloing. Um, and if you have to think of it as well, you're not playing for the audience. Like there, there, you know, there are certain moments where you, you, you want to make people dance and have fun or whatever Mm -hmm. else, but when, you know, we're not playing music for other people, you're playing music for yourself. And, uh, I don't mean that to be, you know, it's not your opportunity to be extremely self-indulgent, but as much as you want to take other people on a journey through your, you know, Im- improvisation, you want to take yourself on one as well. Um, interesting. Uh, that that's a really interesting point, which I am I'm not sure I agree with. Um, <laughs> or I, I I will I will kind of slightly twist it and and say that for me, I think that the most important thing is not necessarily playing for yourself or playing for the audience, but but serving the music. And and not taking away from what you're creating with other people, you know, mm-hmm. it's 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 a shared experience, um, and obviously you're trying to add your your flavor to it. Mm-hmm. But th- there's, I mean, there's a huge difference between a musician playing with other musicians and a musician who could do what they're doing with a backing track or with a band. Mm-hmm. You know, like. We, we, we've seen those kind of, uh, you know, clinic musicians, and I'm not detracting from clinic musicians in any way whatsoever, but there is a certain breed of clinic musician who mm-hmm. just has an iPod with backing tracks, and it's very self-indulgent, and mm-hmm. they're not interacting with what's happening musically in, in any kind of meaningful way. I, I Okay, I, I do understand what you're saying. The The reason that I won't agree with it all the way is I don't think we're ever going to see incredible musicians that don't try and push the boundaries of all of that um, so serving the music is extremely important in every context I think aside from improvisation and when that comes to blues music and jazz especially um, it is all about discovery and your band uh, they're your support and mm-hmm. you will be their support when it comes around to them as well um, it, it you know, it's scary things might go wrong um, the song you know the music that you're playing has never been played before mm-hmm. um, and I think in genres such as jazz and blues and in generally any genre where improvisation plays a big part um, I think that serving the music it ends as soon as you start freely expressing yourself in the moment okay i don't say that i i'm not i don't mean that you stop playing musically you yeah, have yeah. to you know <laughs> yeah yeah um but letting loose and that's where you get the greats that's where you get some some new things yeah new things happening that's not going to happen if you're staying within the rules and the boundaries of serving the music Okay, okay. I, I think I think you're you're disagreeing with me, but but you're also kind of agreeing with me in that there's there is a set of rules that you still need to be following. You know, you, you can't just go completely left field and depart from the musical structure that you're in. Oh no, 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 no. Um, no you're so, you're so. also not going to play you're not going to overstay your welcome. No. No, um, no, no. you're, you're still thinking about that. Yeah, yeah. I don't, look, the whole, I, I don't mean, you know, you get up there, it's your time to solo. I don't mean it's, you know, it's only your moment. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying that, you know, we should all be selfish in that. Um, but I do mean in terms of improvisation itself, mm-hmm. in the form of improvisation, be very free and don't worry. Yeah. Um, and definitely push the boundaries of it all. That doesn't mean yeah. play, for, play a five-minute solo. 
No, I, I'm I'm with you. I agree with that. Um, mm -hmm. And also, I, I, you know, I'm I'm very very aware that it's 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 always a moment that is more ego driven, and not not necessarily in a bad way. It's mm -hmm. it's you're you're pushing yourself to yeah. It's, you should be pushing yourself uh, to demonstrate to yourself that you can do something and you can do better than you've done before. Well, there's that, but you're also pushing the audience. Yeah. You're, you know, and, and you should be pushing the audience. Mm -hmm. You should make the audience question whether you're going to get out of this alive, whether it sounds good. Yeah. Uh, and when that when that is a success, um, there's no there's no better feeling. Definitely. In my opinion. Definitely. No, I, I agree with you on that. And I think that this this kind of comes to a, a very important part of improvisation, um, which is is confidence. Mm -hmm. You know, you you can play absolutely anything that we've spoken about and if if you're a little bit apologetic while you're doing it it's not going to work even if you're playing something that's incredibly safe it's yeah. it's not going to work there's def definitely got to be that confidence and attitude of damn straight this is what i'm playing and this this works this is how i'm expressing myself in this moment right now um and th there's a lot of stuff that's really quite difficult musically you know quite janky in terms of how it sits harmonically over the the backing that unless you you really mean it and you commit to it yeah um it it, it doesn't work um right so i i don't want to kind of turn into a three hour long chat about improvisation i'm sure we could <laughs> I'm, I'm really sure we could um yeah. but but i'd love some kind of some pithy uh, tips for for people about how to approach improvisation. Like, what what are your kind of top three uh, things to think about? Uh, top, th okay. Well, I, to think about, I don't know. Top top three things to try and experiment mm -hmm. with is uh, playing along with the music that you really like. Um, for I assume for harmonica players, uh, you need to find out the key of the song. That's going to be important. I, I'm just going to interject and say that all musicians, you need to find out the key of the song. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, I mean, in the way of of, uh, I'm I'm actually not not specifically playing harmonica music. Uh -huh. Any music that yeah, you yeah. really enjoy. Uh, let's say you wanted to play along to uh, "All Right Now" by Free. Mm. Great tune. Um, there's no harmonica in that. But maybe learning how to find out what key it is and what you can do within that. Uh, and then just playing along. Mm -hmm. uh, filling in the gaps in between the vocal lines, between the lyrics. Or playing at the same time, doing whatever you want, playing over the track. Do that. Uh, you know, if, if you're a big Rolling Stones fan, put one of their records on and play along. Um, and, you know, and for that 45-minute album that you're playing along to, you're part of the band. Mm-hmm. You know, hopefully you're not doing that in front of so many people, but um, it's just fun. It's yeah. just really fun. And it, it does open doors um, into, you know, developing your technique and your, your ability. I think that's probably the, the, the main thing for mm -hmm. me anyway, what I would suggest to people. Um, second is just know your theory. Mm -hmm. uh, know why certain things work. And um, if something you know, jumps out at you as being very, you know, if something sounds particularly cool or you really like the feeling that you get when you hear something, try and find out what that is and why, mm -hmm. why you feel that way and how you can use it in your own playing. Um, and lastly, it's, it's do your, do your homework, do the practice. Yeah. You know, uh, run the drills. Uh, I don't think I'd be very good at, improvising if i didn't have the you know uh the technique uh behind me i i really don't think if i if i didn't spend uh hours working on how to play certain patterns within a scale i don't think i'd be a very good player mm -hmm. i certainly wouldn't be a confident player yeah it's it's that that fluidity and flow that that comes from you know that your technique will get out of the way mm -hmm. so that you can express the musical ideas that you want to if you're also thinking 
how do I go through this patent while you're trying to improvise? So, sorry, you made me think about something. So, uh, very recently, I was teaching a student of mine uh, patents of three. Um, so that's going up three notes and then back one and continuing on from there. So. Musically, so completely unexciting. However, something really fun happens when you, you know, when you're playing over music and you do those those lines. So, did you hear any mistakes there? Oh yeah, because there there were a bunch. I didn't <laughs> stick to the, the patterns of three, and that's the point. Is that like if if I'm playing over some music. If I play that pattern perfectly, it sounds crap. Mm -hmm. It's not going to sound good. But if I, you know, if I occasionally mess up whilst doing my practice, or this is what I would consider doing practice, is trying to play those runs of three. Um, I'm like, oh man, I'm actually being really free with what I'm yeah. playing. I'm not playing what I wanted to, but I found myself in a completely different place, and I want to keep on going. So maybe, maybe, uh, you know. Uh, something to also try is is rather than just playing along to a metronome, I think you should be doing that. But if you have patterns to practice like this or anything repetitive, uh, even if it's as simple as play play that over music that you really enjoy in the key of the song, uh, and you know you're going to make mistakes. So as soon as you start pushing for the next subdivision, you want to play it faster. You're going to start making mistakes and try and keep going even with the mistakes. Uh, and you'll end up, you know, discovering completely new things. And also you'll be giving yourself the confidence that when you do go into a pattern like that, if you do make a mistake, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You've got somewhere to go. Yeah. You have a recovery. Um, I think the more you do that, the, you know, the more free you become. I, I think those are those are brilliant tips, and yeah, making mistakes, make mistakes and learn how to deal with it is is huge. Um, the idea of playing along with with records and playing with you know great musicians is so much better for you than joining your buddies who are also beginners and jamming with them. Like that, that's a lot of fun, but yeah. but you're not going to learn what it feels like to play with a band that are really solid and tight. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, doing both, amazing. Do it yeah. if you can. But um, yeah, it, it, playing along to uh, to your favorite music is um, is a great way to have the best backing band possible for that situation, I suppose. Definitely. Well, yeah. Harry, this has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for for hanging out with well, me. That's okay. Thanks for having me. And uh, before we before we part ways, um, where is the best place for for people to find out more about you and get in touch if they want to to do some uh, music lessons? So, if they, if in terms of uh, music lessons, well, um, the best place to go is to strollersmusic.co.uk, and you can get in touch there. Um, regarding online lessons um i do only offer one-to-one -one video lessons at the moment um but i'm you know i have some availability and happy to take anybody on if they've got any questions um yeah very cool one, one thing I, I would say to obviously this the, the angle of this podcast is is very harmonica focused um sitting down with other music instrument musical instrument teachers good musical instrument teachers is is just as helpful um if not more so than sitting down with a harmonica teacher because they will think about things differently and they'll get you thinking purely musically rather than within the confines of your instrument mm -hmm. uh, and i think that's really really helpful so even if it's just a handful of lessons with a saxophonist or a drummer i had lessons with a drummer last year and and that did huge things for my playing um i think it, it's really really beneficial to take you out of that harmonica zone i i have some some news for you just before we wrap up uh i don't know if i told you this but i booked myself a guitar lesson no way who did you get a, a lesson with ariel posen no way <laughs> <laughs> wow so uh for those who don't know ariel posen he's an incredibly talented guitarist 
Um, and uh, I, I knew that he was teaching occasionally, like he would occasionally do Skype lessons. Uh, and a post came up on, I, I follow him on Instagram, and a post came up and he said, oh, I'll be doing some online lessons, some Skype lessons in October. Uh, get in touch. There are limited spaces. And I happened to be on my Instagram app just as maybe probably like a few minutes after he posted it. So there weren't that many views on it yet. So uh, I immediately sent him a message saying, I'd love to book in. Uh, do you have any space available? And uh, yeah, I do. So on the 13th of October, I've got my, my Skype lesson. I'll be a student again for the first time in oh, 12, 13 years. That's cool. That's really cool. And, and, and also really great for, for people to hear that an amazingly talented, uh, confident, professional guitarist is, is still excited about getting lessons and oh, still has stuff to learn. I, I have a lot to learn and I have a very long list of questions for him. Um, yeah, I don't think you ever stop learning. No. I agree. And and I, I still get lessons and uh, highly recommend it. All right. Well, Harry, this has been delightful. And uh, hopefully we can do this again sometime. We can chat about some other musical related stuff. Absolutely. And Absolutely. hopefully we can play together soon. That would be delightful. Yeah, that would be good. Maybe we'll start. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to start doing some of your podcasts uh, face to face. Dude, that would be delightful. Yeah, it would be good. All right. Well, catch you later. All right, man, you take care. Thanks very much for having me. My pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of My Harmonica Podcast. Please don't forget to subscribe and leave a review on your podcast service of choice. And if you're ready to take your harmonica playing to the next level, then you should check out my online harmonica school over at tomlinharmonicaschool.com. Happy harping.